What is going on, everyone? I'm your host, Aman, and welcome to episode number 16 of Frame by Frame, a podcast all about your favorite movies and TV shows. And joining me today is the one without a nickname, Jemmy. How are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Just got off work. Um, been a pretty interesting week news-wise. A lot mm-hmm. of good stuff. Pleasant, some pleasant surprises, honestly. So excited yeah. to get into there it. Might, there might actually have been an advantage to us delaying this week's podcast because you know we just got yeah. a whole bunch of news dropping today. Uh, but yeah, guys, apologies yeah. for the episode delay. I haven't been feeling well for the last week or so ish. Uh, you can also probably see my voice is a little different. Uh, but hey, we're here today, and uh, let's talk some movies and TV shows, shall we? Um, so yeah, before we All start. Right. Make sure to subscribe to our channel for daily content. You can further support our show by heading over to Spotify or Apple Podcast and leaving a five-star review. Every five-star review will be read live on the show. And before we begin, let's go ahead and take a moment to acknowledge our patrons, our framers. So let's go ahead and talk about Bucky Blue, Hopple, Alpaca Tom, SAZ, Brandon's mom, Brandon's bro, Brandon's wife, Brandon herself, our man Amon, Anna Hudak, Nikolai Knight, Cypher Primus, and... Marcus O'Neill. If you'd like to hear your name at the start of one of these, go ahead and head, uh, start one of our podcasts. Go ahead and head over to SaveTheGameMedia.com. There we've got lots of perks, exclusive stuff, and a lot of great things to enhance your whole experience. Mm-hmm. You can go ahead and get in. Our, yep, you can also go ahead and join our Discord server where you can track the hosts and co-hosts of every podcast on Save the Game Media. So yeah, make sure to uh, make sure to head over to the Discord. We'd love to see you chatting over there. Uh, but with that out of the way, Jeremy, what have you been watching this week? This week, well, I saw Black Adam in theaters, so that was pretty good. I actually wanted to see something else. I wasn't able to make it over in time for the theater. That uh, See How They Run movie. Been mm-hmm. been looking forward to that. Um, I am a big Whovian, Doctor Who fan, so oh, I yes. saw The Power of the Doctor. Uh-huh. It was very, very honest. Look, I wasn't... I always liked Jodie Whitt- Whittaker. I thought, frankly, her writing, the writing always underdeserved her. I thought it was a pretty good episode. I'm glad we got to bow out. That ending, i um, very excited to see what comes next uh, for the franchise. I'm very curious how they're going to do this one. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, I'm trying to think. What else did I watch? It was honestly a pretty light watching. Wait, before, me, before you move say. on, spoiler, yeah. for, spoiler alert for our viewers. Uh, what are your thoughts on David Tennant? He- um, I mean... He's my he's my favorite doctor. He was yes, my introduction. My I came doctor. in. He was while, my introduction. I came in while he was done. Um, now here's what I think. You know, I'm all for some more tenant. I'm assuming they're gonna have some mystery, so I'm fully on board. You know, we're gonna be seeing. I forgot the actor's name. We're gonna be seeing the new actor for the fifteenth pretty soon. Uh, obviously, Gatto, I think. Yes, um, yeah. Excited to see him. I'm excited to see what David, you know, can bring. You know, for another go round at the character. So I'm all for it. I'm all for it, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I actually yeah. got off Doctor Who like right after Matt Smith's run. Uh, I just mm-hmm. fell off there. Uh, I, I'm actually looking to get back into it, so I still need to watch Peter Capaldi. Sure. The Jody Capaldi Bush, era is pretty and, good. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I do like haven't... Capaldi's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, still need to go around those. But yeah, go ahead. What else have you watched? Other than that, honestly, not really too much. I'm trying to think what else did I do. I, there's something. There was a movie I watched. I can't remember. It'll come to me. But other than that, I mean, I kept up with Andor. I actually missed previously the finale for uh, uh, Rings of Power. So I went ahead and caught that. Finally caught up with that. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, I think Rings of Power was exactly what it needed to be. Mm-hmm. As of right now, honestly, I'd have to say it slightly edges out Ring. Uh, not Rings of <laughs> Power. It slightly edges out House of the Dragon. Um, again, that's only slightly. We mm-hmm. saw now again. Give it some more time to digest. But mm-hmm. overall, I think there's been a pretty strong time for fantasy either way. Really strong, for sure. really strong for, sure. for fantasy. For sure. Other than that, honestly, yeah. not too much. Just mm-hmm. mainly positioning myself for a lot of the good stuff coming later. You know, got some good stuff from Marvel, DC, still. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, Amazon. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's what it was. Peripheral, peripheral. There's a new peripheral. Amazon show called Peripheral that started. Has mm-hmm. Chloe Grace, uh, Merge, whatever. I really, I really liked the first episode. I uh, tried it out. Looking for it. it's basically almost like a more serious uh, HBO Maxi type uh, Ready Player One story. So instead of being filled with cameos, oh, okay. just more focusing on it. But I'd, I'd recommend that one. Looks like it's going to be a good one. Check out. It's what made it by about? some of the team that. Um, it's basically so you have this. Um, programmer lady who gets in she gets um finds out that she gets to go into the super secret digital world program mystery and suits wouldn't really want to spoil much more than that mm-hmm. but it okay. definitely is made by the same team that made westworld 
So, oh, you know, okay. if you're if you're if you're yeah, into like those them. kind of heady science fiction type things, you you'd like you'd probably like this. Westworld season one was fantastic, but after that the show kind of fell off. But uh yeah, writers of Westworld, I'm down. Uh but what have I watched this week? Um so um, you know, me and my friends were sort of going through like a horror movie watch through this entire week. So we were nice. watching a movie every night with the Halloween season. Uh so the first one was The Ring. Um, you know, the classic I would say. Um, mm-hmm. it, it came out in 2002. It was okay for the most part. Didn't really find it scary. Uh, didn't live up to my expectations. But the one I really enjoyed, the, these two movies in particular, Nightmare on Elm Street, fantastic movie. So underappreciated. I like, I've watched the Hall- Halloween movies. I always thought Halloween movies were better than Nightmare on Elm Street. But goddamn, this mm-hmm. movie was freaking fantastic. You know, the camp was perfectly done. Yes, it was over the top. It was campy. You know, all the uh, exaggerated uh, effects and all of that. But that's what it's supposed to be. And, uh, you know, after watching Werewolf by Night, no, yeah. I was like, I was, I was struck with it. And yeah, yeah really enjoyed it. Um, and the next thing I watched was The Shining. Uh, first time watching mm-hmm. it and uh, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Jack Nicholson, goddamn, what an actor. This guy had probably some of the best roles in, like, you know, movie history, you know, from Hannibal Lecter, Jack Torrance in uh, Shining, and then obviously the Joker. So, yeah, loved his performance in that movie. Very creepy movie. I would say it started off really slow. I was like, okay, this isn't really going anywhere. But I I think it was around the half an hour mark where it just hits you with that creepy, Mm -hmm. uh, ominous vibe the movie had. And yeah, really, really enjoyed it. not, uh, and lastly, uh, the House of Dragon finale. Um, and yeah, overall, I would say it was a good season. Um, I would give it a 7 out of 10. Not, <coughs> it was exactly what I expected it to be. Nothing over the top. No, not, nowhere near as close as the first season of Game of Thrones, if you ask me. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's mm-hmm. what I would do. Yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, should we move on to story number one? Which Probably is, a good idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Black Adam review. So, Jemmy, what were your thoughts on Black Adam? Um, ultimately, I thought it basically was exactly the movie that I needed to do. You know, the reality is DC is in a... I'm not even going to say precarious, honestly. It's just in an interesting point. We're definitely at a crossroads. It's gone through a lot, and we don't even need to rehash it because we probably talk about it every episode at this point. This movie, however, I honestly felt was a pleasant surprise. This is arguably, I think, aside from a few things, one of the superhero movies that stayed the longest in development. This was in development within the early 2000s. And The Rock has been yeah. attached since then. The Rock was so the fact they finally in 2007? So that's insane. Yeah, The Rock was passed in 2007. It's... So this movie predates the DCEU itself. So, yeah, you know, this movie was literally being planned and working on while they were doing The Dark Knight, before The Dark Knight even came down. Mm-hmm. So... You know, seeing a culmination of some odd over a decade's worth of work, it's interesting. Was it a great movie? No. Was it a particularly deep movie? No. Honestly, would I ever sit, say, be sitting down and be like, hey, I really want to watch Black Adam? Eh, honestly, not so sure about that. But I think this movie is exactly what it used to be. The action, while not as necessarily as good as we'd see from DC... Say what you want about Snyder, but I do think that his action and his framing is the top bar that they've set so far. Um, well, it wasn't as good, but it was definitely good. You know, there I felt like the action scenes did a good job to service the film. And honestly, this movie, I was talking to my brother, this movie felt like a video game, but not even in a bad way. It very much felt like you have scene that talks about exposition, that talks about talking. And then you move to the action and the fight scene. And in some movies, that would be bad pacing. But in this one, it honestly kind of works. Because at the end of the day, this, was, this wasn't this was really, you know, this wasn't some deep plot. This isn't talking about, you know, the ethics of being an anti-hero and the morality of your actions. It lightly touches on those areas. But it's mostly about seeing Dwayne The Rock Johnson fight the Justice Society and also fight Intergang and just be Dwayne The Rock Johnson. If you don't come in expecting anything more than that, you're going to be fine. That's honestly why I think a lot of the... There's such a weird disparity between the audience uh, score, Rotten Tomatoes, audience oh, yeah. reception, and, then the and look at how critics are seeing it. Critics, I think, are actually expecting this to be a superhero movie or even a good movie. I'm not weighing this like a superhero movie. I'm not even weighing it against the rest of the DCU. I'm weighing it as a rock movie because that's what this movie, is. Uh-huh. It's a rock movie through and exactly. through. 
you know. Exactly. Now, if this is the template for what we're going to see from DC, I'm going to say it. We're going to talk about more later future DC stuff. I'd be open to seeing more stuff like this from DC in the future. I don't think this should be everything that they do, but I definitely think that I definitely think that you know there's more room for that type of stuff. So that's probably my non-spoiler stuff I'd say about the movie. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, for me, I thought the movie was enjoyable. Again, as he said, was it amazing? No. But my favorite part, I have to say, was uh, the action sequences. Absolutely amazing. Dr. Fates. See, the CGI in this movie, top-notch. Uh, and yeah, the costume designs, again, absolutely amazing. And, and that post credit scene leaves you wanting more. So again, that's the good in this movie. I really enjoyed it as a superhero fan. That's all. That's the bare minimum I can ask for any superhero movie. And I was, uh, I went in there expecting something, a, a you know, a piece of garbage movie. But again, I was not. I was pleased with what I got. I was pleased with what I got. Like I would say, The Rock is like Tom Cruise of the modern era. Uh, you know, it's like when you go watch a Tom Cruise movie, you know it's a Tom Cruise movie. Now, when you're going to watch yeah. a Rock movie, you know it's a Rock movie. So you know that's exactly what it was. Um, the bad in this movie, I would say, uh, it felt like there were a lot of different plot lines going on at once. You know, Dr. Fate felt like a whole different story. Like his entire thing could have been made into a separate movie, I think. Uh, the JSA as well. Uh, but yeah, it felt like a lot of things were going on at the same time. And then at the end, they just throw in a villain around the halfway mark and make him the big bad of the story. I would say those those are probably my criticism. And yeah, again, the villain wasn't great, but Black Adam was supposed to be the villain. So, uh, but yeah, overall, I would say it's a solid 6.5 out of 10 movie. Enjoyed it. Not great, but still a fun watch. Yep, probably say the same. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, but yeah, uh, earlier this week, we got an article from um, THR, which basically con- uh, gave us <clears throat> uh, which basically gave us some, um, it was titled DC-, DC at a turning point. So, you know, a bunch of leaks, rumors, stuff about DC, what's going on over there. So a lot is mentioned in this article, uh, but uh, let's start off with the DC EU section. Uh, so just earlier today was dropped that James Gunn and Peter Safran are the co-chairs of WB's recently formed DC Studios. Um, again, D, uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Jim? Well, I believe when we mentioned on whatever episode it was on who should be the DC chair, Gunn's name was mentioned thrown around. If I remember correctly, my thought was basically this. I think James Gunn is honestly one of the best uh, creatives right now making superhero movies. Um... He's one of the best creators making superhero movies right now. I think, personally, I am all for seeing him do more stuff. The only hesitation was whether or not he could do the business stuff. But if we've got somebody for the business stuff, then I think that will work out fine, you know? I'm not super familiar. Uh, I forgot the other guy's name. I'd have to look it back up. I'm not super familiar with him. But I do know that he has a decent pedigree and stuff within uh, DC already. So I'm really excited to see more from that. Uh, Gunn, on the other hand, he's already proven his track record. If he's going to be focused on the creative side, I really don't see a downside. The only downside I see is the fact that this could potentially impact his output of movies, which, again, for what it's worth, it seems like he's pretty much made his mark with Marvel. With DC, you know, he's obviously still doing some projects, but I doubt it's going to be super much or super a lot so i do think you know when we get into this as we see more i think that both of them will be a good spot the only concern though is the fact that we're still seeing a four-year deal which makes me feel like those rumors that warner brothers is trying to sell true Mm -hmm. i don't think that it's only a four-year deal because they might be nervous about gun or anything because objectively he's probably made them more money this year than anyone else I think it's more of a fact that the reality is Warner Brothers may not even be a thing. Projections, you know, their variety themselves are talking about how, you know, they're looking probably to sell by 2024. So this four-year plan, you know, might just be that's the realistic cap. Now, here's the thing. The reality is if you just look at Marvel's schedule right now, within the next four years, we're going to have the entire multiverse saga. So four years is plenty of time to do a lot. It's just about will DC have the push, you know? We're seeing all this stuff about Superman coming back. We're seeing all this stuff Mm -hmm. about Keaton and Affleck sticking around. We're seeing all this stuff about Man of Steel 2, New Flash, Wonder Woman 4, Blue Beetle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, all this type of stuff. I'm all for that. But you know what I was also all for? 
the five different DC plans that have been announced in the past two years. So, James Gunn, other dude, shoot, even <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson, <laughs> David Zadislav. So that's where we're at right now. As long as Zadislav actually lets them make something, I'm all for it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think that he is the only thing stopping them from doing it. But do you see a reality where Warner Bros. doesn't sell, but they do sell off DC Studios as a whole? So they have that, that those set of IP out of their way? Or I mean, them? not really, only because of this. It looks like right now what AT&T is trying to do is basically clear house and make as much money as possible. Objectively speaking, DC... Mm, I'd have to look at the numbers because I do know they technically own Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. But yeah, by I the numbers, DC... Bros, yeah, DC so by far, Sesame DC Street makes... Warner Bros? No, War yes, DC. Oh, yeah, yes, okay. DC owns Sesame Street. No, Warner Bros. <laughs> owns Sesame Street. Uh, so I at least they have some deal with Sesame Workshop or something. So at the very least, so but by the numbers, DC makes them gonzo amounts of money. Even right now, who are the most popular superheroes in terms of merchandise sold batman yeah, superman absolutely. wonder woman they own all three yeah so they own the three most popular superheroes i couldn't really see a situation where warner brothers still exists and they sell off their most popular and most profitable thing at this stage i feel like it's either discovery basically dislodges warner brothers separates into all its equal parts warner brothers film dc uh dc studios and sasha entertainment Warner Brothers Interactive, all that stuff, and calls it a day, or they keep it all together, but just shrink and downsize the company, which is what we're seeing, you know, stuff like the Cartoon Network thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's fair. But so, ultimate, but, you know, it's just seeing what happens, I guess. Mm -hmm. it's, hard to, it's, hard, it's hard to get excited when you know, um, you know, uh, one man can just destroy everything that's, you know, the company's tried to build, but... Uh, uh, but yeah, the next part of this, um, Henry Cavill, I think yesterday, last night, he came out and confirmed uh, that he is back as Superman. And everything we've seen is just um, a taste of what's to come. Um, this personally has me super excited. Henry Cavill was probably my favorite Superman. Uh, I, Although Mind of Steel was not an amazing movie, I enjoyed his portrayal of the character. I think he looks exactly like... Uh, <clears throat> He, I think he looks exactly like uh, what well, Superman is supposed to be from the comics. And uh, yeah, uh, as a fan of the comics, I love Henry Cavill. Can't wait to see more of him. Uh, how do you feel about him coming back? I mean, for me personally, I think that the idea of Superman coming back is really good. Um, I'm all for his portrayal. I'm all for what we've already seen from him. You know, like you said, Man of Steel wasn't necessarily the best. But at the same time, in a Snyder-less version of Superman, I think that worked out really good. Now, the thing is, though... Who should he be? Who, how are they going to use him? As of right now, DC has not used Superman well. I just think there's no, there's no getting around that. He got one movie. He got, he got one and a half movies. Because Batman vs. Superman, if we're being honest, Batman vs. Superman felt more like a Batman movie with Superman in it than a Batman and Superman movie. But we got one with him. We got... Um, you know, some cameo Justice, appearances, yeah. headless, and that's about it. We got him in it. Justice League for a bit. Justice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got him in Justice League. And we got him again in Snyder's. But at the end of the day, again, it's barely anything. Who should be the person to spearhead? I've seen a lot of people point out that right now, Matthew Vaughn and Henry Cavill have been working together like this. So the idea of Matthew Vaughn coming on a Superman project, Jeff's kiss. Um, I'd be all for that. Um, or even then, anyone else. Quiet as is kept, I don't, this might be worth mentioning, but when DC originally recruited James Gunn, they originally asked him what character he wanted to do. According to the rumors, he initially asked he to do Superman, Superman, and they said no, and that's why he ended up doing Suicide Squad. Yep. He might not sound like the initial pick, but James Gunn's Suicide Squad, especially if they're talking about bringing in a character like Brainiac as the villain, who's been rumored for a while, for a potential Man of Steel 2, Mm -hmm. Could be legitimately great. And I think possibly the best Superman movie we'd get. <laughs> now, again, this is all a time will tell thing. From what I remember, I believe Variety released a report or somebody saying that he's only right now basically signed one-off deals. So he signed a deal for Black Adam. 
there's a lot of rumors that he's going to be the post credit scene for Flash as well, or appear in some function of Flash. But aside yeah. from that, even DC hasn't fully settled where he's going to appear again. Yeah. So as long as, you know, our version that we get, we actually get to see, I'm all for it. If he's just going to be a cameo that shows up in other people's stories, then yeah. I'm a little bit cooler. But at the end of the day, Superman, Superman. Yeah, the Hollywood Reporter, um, on the article that broke around last week-ish, um, said that he is in talks for a, uh, for a sequel to Man of Steel. He hasn't signed anything yet, so it isn't confirmed, but Warner Bros. are actively pursuing uh, working on Man of Steel 2 with him. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great, though. I believe that, but Warner Brothers actively pursued just about <laughs> every... They've actively pursued a movie for literally every character they own. So at this point, you know, it's a question of what will make me feel better is when Henry Cavill is on a Hall H stage saying presenting and then he shows the Man of Steel 2 logo. That's what will make me feel good. And Sasha walks up with him and we announce that we're having Man of Steel with Superman and Supergirl teaming up. That's what's going to make me happy. Until then, I'm like, all right. Fandom 2023. But yeah, uh, we all know the chances of that are. Happy You're young. funny. Pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this article also confirms that uh, James funny. Gunn has pitched a secret movie. Now, I'm sure this pitch has now turned into uh, reality because he's the head of DC Studios. So, um, yeah. <laughs> kind of secret I'm movies? just imagining that movie. <laughs> so, James, you uh, have yeah. a movie for me? Yes, Classic sir, man. I do. <laughs> Plastic Man. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, I'm, here's fan, what I'm... Here's what I'm thinking, honestly. Mm -hmm. If James Gunn is running it right now, I think it's safe to say that every project we have right now probably has a decent chance of continuing. Knowing his style, knowing his visual style, and knowing what's currently developing, I feel like Booster Gold or the Justice Society itself are probably the project. Mm -hmm. Just because, again, Gold and we know for... Ted Cord, Blue Beetle. Yes, Blue, no, yeah, Booster Gold and Blue Beetle. That's why. That so, because, again, we know we're, they're working on a Blue Beetle project, and we know that they're leaving out Ted Cord. We know for a fact, it was confirmed, I think, last week, that they'll have his wife or his daughter or something, but they're not going to have the original Ted Cord. Meanwhile, there's always been rumors as... They have Cord Industries what is that? in the movie? Cord Industries or whatever his company's called. Yeah, so they'll have Cord Industries and they'll have Victoria Cord, who I believe is supposed to play his wife. It would be supposed to be his wife in the universe, but they won't have Ted Cord being it. They confirmed. Uh, I mean, as a DC fan, I'm loving this. Looks like DC actually has a plan. And Black Adam might have just been the start. So, uh, and we all know how good James Gunn is at creating movies. You know, uh, he's probably made the best DCEU movie, best DCEU TV show, and uh, you know, top ten Marvel movies across the tier. So, yeah. Well, at least with the DC stuff, it's not a very high bar. But I do agree. <laughs> So yeah, the next section of the Hollywood Reporter article basically said that uh, the Batman 2 with Matt Reeves is officially happening. Uh, and now, yeah, we, most of us already knew this, but the interesting part of this article was um, it, it basically stated that there are ongoing talks for spinoffs based on characters such as Scarecrow, Professor Pig, and Clayface. Uh, now, again, these are very obscure characters, not even like, you know, most people consider uh, the heavy hitters of uh, Batman's rogues gallery. Uh, but yeah, interesting picks. Jemmy, uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, these characters potentially receiving spinoff movies or maybe even TV shows? Yeah, I mean, again, the idea of a fully fledged Batman universe should excite any comic book fan. For me personally, I've always been more in love with the sort of street level side of DC. So the idea of getting to see that separate from the DCU is basically the best of both worlds. You know, we're getting bombastic stuff like the Justice Society, the Justice League, the Suicide Squad in DCEU. Now we can focus on more character-driven stories, arcs, and stuff with the with um the Reeves verse or whatever it ends up being called. I think that's a great great option. Um, as for you know these villain spinoffs, I'm really interested in seeing the dynamic and how they build it out. This is really honestly the first time we'll see something like this, having one character dedicated that's going to get an entire universe built around them. You know. We might see something with Marvel because I know that Jay, uh, not James Gunn, uh, Ryan Coogler has signed a similar deal to the one James Gunn did to develop like Wakanda-based properties. That's why he's doing Ironheart already, uh, linking that to that. But um, the idea and prospect of having Reeves and other directors partner up seems like, you know, a match made in heaven. We get to see, you know, actually Batman take time and fight over because, you know, the reality is 
three movies is not really enough to develop a full rogues gallery and give it the attention that it needs to do. By doing these shows, by doing these spinoffs, that gives it so that way you can have your Batman movies not have to worry about developing a universe because you can develop the universe on the other side so we can focus on Batman just living in the universe that's already being created around him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, the well, well, out of all of these three projects, which one are you most excited for? If you know, they, they, it was announced that one of them would be receiving a movie or a TV show. Honestly, Clayface. Clayface has always been one of my favorite Batman. Clayface, yeah. Hugo Strange, and um, he, uh, Rish have always been my three favorites. Honestly, so I'd be. I'm really interested because in, honestly, the thing about this one is. They can go a lot of different directions. Clayface as a character is great because he's not a character. There's been five separate Clayfaces, and each one have different unique motivations. We also, I believe, on the casting list for Penguin, Penguin. it's already been reported that Clayface was going to appear in some form. Yeah. So it seems like they're already introducing him that. Now the question is, again, which version of Clayface we're getting? There's just the straight criminal with the disfigured face version. There's the guy who melts people's faces, which I'd really like to see. Or we could get full shapeshifter. I'd honestly be down for either of those. They could even do something arguably a little bit in the middle. For those of you, you know, who watch Batman the Animated Series, I could see them kind of going similar to Clayface's origin in Batman the Animated Series, just not going as far. So maybe having the idea that he could shift his face or maybe be a disguise, but he might not necessarily be a mud monster, you know. Right. This is still a more like golden age. Universe as of right more, now. more like the golden but, age. But um, yeah, golden age, golden age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but again, either way, here's the thing. Again, we just saw a trailer this week for one of the most cosmic and out there villains for Marvel. Marvel started off by showing terrorists in the Middle East and having a billionaire in an iron suit. So, just because it starts off ground, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. And for what it's worth, Batman lore-wise, in lore, it's usually he starts off until about year three, fighting just normal gangsters and stuff. He's right. not the actual supervillains come year three. So, that's, yeah. that's established Batman lore. Batman, the movie, takes place in year two. So, if they want to go full weird, if they want to go full supervillain... They could do that, and now's the chance to do it, because it would follow up with Batman lore. Just because it started ground, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to stay so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that would make perfect sense. You know, I, I've always... You know, Bat Batman, like, he might look like a very street-level grounded character, but uh, there are a lot of fantastical stories in there. You know, Poison Ivy, uh, even Killer Croc, uh, Man Bat. So yeah, I'm, I'm very. Mm -hmm. I, I really hope Matt Reeves one day, you know, actually explores these more fantastical elements of Batman. But uh, the project I'm most excited about uh, out of these three would probably be Professor Pig. Uh, my first exposure to the character was uh, the Arkham Knight game, and that gameplay segment of Batman versus Professor Pig was honestly one of the best. Was honestly one of the best parts of that game, and uh, yeah, uh, the creepy and ominous vibe the character has. Oh, I yeah, think it would sure. fit. It would fit in perfectly with uh, what Reeves has in mind for his Batman universe. So yeah, I'm really, really, really excited for the Professor Pig project, if it happens. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, one more thing yeah. that was confirmed just this morning was that Anthony Campos uh, will serve as a showrunner for the Batman spinoff series about Arkham Asylum. Uh, I'm not really sure what he's done before, uh, but he was the showrunner of Staircase, I believe, uh, a horror-ish TV show, and The Devil All the Time was starring um, um, Tom Holland. That a movie on Netflix. So yeah, I'm. Uh, I like that movie. Uh, Staircase. I've heard really good things about. So I'm curious to see where this plot project ends up. Uh, but Jemmy, what do you think this project is? Do you think it's gonna be like an anthology series about, uh, you know, every villain and within Arkham Asylum and how they end up there, or something else? I mean, I think there's a lot of different directions they could go, and it's honestly it depends on. I think this is really depending on what type of show this is. This really could be sort of, mm, in a way, I could honestly see the Batman, the movie, being sort of the prologue to this universe and Arkham Asylum potentially kicking off. Because as of right now, where are we leaving Gotham? Underwater, pretty bad state. This could be a lot of avenues. We could already have, because, I mean, given the fact that the Joker existed, there could potentially be other rogues gallery that existed. I couldn't really see them going too far. But I could mm -hmm. see a couple of them are existed. So we apology for, oh, 
This is how I got a Narcan. This is how you got a Narcan. On the other hand, um, there has been some rumors that they might actually have Harley Quinn as like a focal point character, which I think would be pretty interesting because then you could do possibly her interviewing or doing characters like that. Now, all of that being said, I think another really interesting plot would just be straight taking a look inside the asylum, not worrying about origins and stuff like that. I'd really like to see a series where we just get to see either staff workers or villains themselves in the asylum basically bouncing off each other, interacting, maybe some mystery or something like that. Whatever this show is, I feel like there's, frankly, a big burden on it, you know, even more so than The Penguin, even more so than I think these other projects. Because Arkham Asylum, arguably even more so than some of these villains they're adapting, is such an iconic part of the Batman mythos Mm -hmm. that, you know, it'll have to do a lot. Because the setting of this show, how this show determines, will kind of set the stage for basically the rest of the universe, you know. We've already gotten a look at Reeves Gotham, but other than a few scenes, we didn't really get a scene that Reeves Arkham. Arkham, Batman-wise, might as well be its own character, you know, in terms of the amount of lore, in terms of the amount of depth, in terms of what it means to the Batman mythos. So that type of stuff, you know, that's the balancing act that I have to do. And for what it's worth, we've seen Reeves already do it once. Shoot, we've seen Reeves already do it twice, because we can't forget about uh, the the world building of the uh, what's it called? The H trilogy. trilogy. Mm-hmm. And the new showrunner guy, he looks like he definitely has a good... Huh? Yeah, the, the Ape Trilogy. Play Ape Trilogy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we've already seen him do that. Already seen him do that. So, and this new showrunner guy, again, has a good pedigree on his shoulders. So I think ultimately this this one will be a good job. I'm, I'm very curious to see what they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the fact that this was originally supposed to be like a GCPD show and how it slowly evolved into an Arkham Asylum show is very interesting. Uh, but one more thing I wanted to ask you was um, how yeah. involved do you think Batman will be in these projects uh, as a whole? Because, uh, you know, Robert Prince is a big star. He might cost big bucks. Do you think we're going to see him in all these projects? Or is it's going to be a little different? I do definitely think we'll see him a lot more just because they kind of already told us. Um, after right after the Batman finished, both Patterson and Reeves signed like a multi-picture five-year deal. First look, it wasn't explicitly stated as Batman, but it was obvious it was going to be Batman-related stuff. Now, one thing I would say is I don't really want them to appear that much, and if they do use them, I want them to use them sparingly. Mm-hmm. Right now, we're going to get a dedicated trilogy to Batman. That's not that's 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 already known. I'm fine with him being the full character in that and then just seeing either little cameos or little moments here and there in other projects. Honestly, I'd much rather see Bruce Wayne in more of these projects than Batman. Just because, again, I feel like this is a chance to build some of those corners of Gotham away from the legacy of the Bat. So that way, the Batman elements have more impact. The beauty of this, and I feel like one thing that people haven't really internalized, this is the first time we're ever to get you know, them developing alongside. So that way, when you have Scarecrow or Pig or, or Clayface or whoever show up in a movie, show up in a project, we can be like, oh, I've already seen you before. And it has that added weight of actually having them, you know, do things within this universe. If this is just having them already stop by Batman, interacting with Batman, then it loses some of those moments where we could potentially get, here's a villain who's already set up. Now here's their first conflict with Batman. Instead, it could just be like, oh, Batman swoops and saves the day. That that could lead to a feeling a bit cheaper in terms of the world building. Now, again, ultimately, these people know a lot more than me when it comes to build, making good movies, so I trust them. But that's just where my head is at right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I like you know, uh, I don't want Batman to be involved in all these projects, but I want his presence to be felt there. Like you know, the beginning ten minutes of uh, you could say the Batman movie, we see you know just low level thugs doing you know criminal acts, and then the bat signal lights up, and suddenly there is an element of fear that's built there, and you know Batman's not really there, but his presence is felt, and I want that to be felt throughout these projects. And uh, yeah, that will do for insane amount of world building, and you know the what we've seen in the Batman movie. Every villain was not their full version of themselves yet. You know, the Penguin, he wasn't really the Penguin in the movie. Uh, he was still Oswald Cobblepot. Same with the Riddler. He wasn't really the Riddler until the end of the movie. And the Joker mm-hmm. as well, to, to some extent. So these projects could be that groundwork 
and or you know just lay the foundation for these characters and then eventually they could pop up in the movie and it would make sense for their cameo or their big part in the movie uh and yeah that's just the way i see it okay but yeah honestly i'm hyped for this looks like wb are really giving matt reeves everything he needs in order to create his batverse and uh yeah like i like i said i never thought we would actually see a professor pig movie or tv show or in a clayface project and these might you know actually be theatrical releases and that's awesome uh, i'm curious about how again batman will be involved and yeah uh, as a Batman fan, I couldn't ask for more. Is there anything else you want to add, Jimmy, before we move on? All right. Uh, so earlier this week, we also got our first trailer for the upcoming Ant-Man movie. Uh, so, yeah, before uh, before we talk about it, let's just have a quick view of the trailer together. So share screen. Here we mm -hmm. go. I used to ask myself a lot of questions. Scott, you're at ex-con. How are you an Avenger? That doesn't make sense. But everywhere I go, people tell me the same thing. Thank you, Spider-Man. People still need help, Dad. That's why we made this. It's like a satellite for deep space, but Quana. Wait, wait a minute. You're sending a signal down to the quantum realm. Turn it off. Now! Secret universe beneath ours. What are you so afraid of? There's something I never told you. This place. It isn't what you think. Oh, I find it inside of my future lies beyond. I can get you home and give you more time. If you help me, so what's it gonna be? Batman. What a trailer. Um, this is probably the best Ant-Man trailer we've had so far. And uh, yeah, Jemmy, what are your thoughts on the trailer? I'm an Ant-Man defender. I think that, you know, these movies are almost the perfect palate cleansers in a lot of ways, at least they previously were. You know, you had Ant-Man coming out right before Civil War, Ant-Man the Wasp coming out right before, uh, right between Infinity War and Endgame. This movie, for the first time, though, will be not a palate cleanser, but a palate sense center. Mm -hmm. Setter. There we go. Palette Setter. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be setting the stage for Phase 5. If this is in Phase 5, and to be frank, if this were going from Ant-Man to Phase 5, then I'm very excited for the potential of the multiverse saga. These look like Guardian-style visuals in our Ant-Man movie. Exactly. Quiet as is kept, this looks like what Multiverse of Madness probably should have been. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I also saw for some people, you know, who are the spoiler minded, there were some leaks and stuff that came out today. And it also makes me think that this honestly plot wise has the potential to be one of Marvel's strongest openings. Um, the trailer itself, I thought did really well. I've already seen the leak trailer from uh, Comic-Con. For those of you who might not know, this is not the same as the leak trailer it is a different cut. Some of the scenes were the same, but there was a couple scenes that were different pacing wise. So, um, you know, it seems like they're trying to save, which makes sense. There was a couple elements that I'd imagine they might want to save for a second trailer, uh, MODOK, stuff like that. But from what we did see, getting a look at the quantum realm, all the different creatures, you know, that cantina definitely gave me like Moss Eisley vibes or whatever when they were walking in with that bartender, with the alien bartender or whatever. 
So the idea that we're going to be getting this type of stuff, again, from our Ant-Man movie, really excites me. Jonathan Majors, Kang, while a lot of people, very rightly, are going to talk about Thanos as, you know, the gold standard, I really do think that Kang has the potential to and probably will surpass Thanos. Simply because of the fact is we're getting more contact with him. We're getting a lot of Kang content. We've already seen him within, you know, a Loki. And given the fact, I've got a personal theory. I saw somebody point this out. I've already seen it developing as a theory online once the movies mm -hmm. came out. But just mm -hmm. looking at the tech we see right now, the ba right now we've got basically a lot of different MacGuffins in Marvel. We've got the bangles, we've got Shang-Chi's rings, and there's even rumors that they're going to introduce another MacGuffin within this Ant-Man movie. There's been a big question about what those are. And if you look at the technology, it at very least looks similar. A lot of this stuff. Not sure. only that, but this ring motif is another thing that's also associated with the Eternals. The Eternals, right now, the Eternals, the Bengals, Shang-Chi's rings, and King's technology visually have a lot of similarities. Now, oh, yeah. what those turn out to be could be anything. And for whatever it's worth, there's only so many ways you can do magic ring that glows. But given the fact that all of these are being worked on at the same time, I feel like there's a chance that we're already seeing some groundwork for how the King Dynasty is going to play out. And based on what we're already seeing, I'm very hyped for what the Avengers will be facing. Oh, yeah. And then again, Jonathan Majors looks cunning as ever, as cunning as ever in this trailer alone. You know, for what, what like 30 seconds of screams time he had, he's had in this trailer, I can't wait to see him perform as uh, Kang. And from that leak trailer when he's like, are you an Avenger? Have I killed you before? Can't wait to see that scene play out in the movie. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's just a testament to his range because although we're not Tiffany now, the Creed trailer also came out recently. And he does good in that. And I'm also afraid of him in that. But I'm a very different afraid of the Creed, of the character he's bringing Creed, than the character he's bringing as Kang. In both ways, which is a testament to how versatile of an actor he is. Even then, at Black Adam, there's a war movie, I believe, around the Korean War, that there was a trailer that he was in. And again, I'm very excited for Jonathan to get a lot more parts. He definitely deserves it. For sure, for sure. Uh, but yeah, but we also got another trailer this week, and that is the Guardians of the Galaxy special, um, which is again another Marvel special presentation. So let's jump. Must ahead be and Christmas we'll already, baby. baby. <laughs> exactly. Let's let's jump into that. I just saw on the calendar that right now on Earth, it's almost Christmas time. We don't have time for triviality for Christmas. But Peter's so sad about Gamora being gone. Maybe if we go to Earth for a really wonderful Christmas gift, it would make him happy. Something special he will never forget. What about someone special? We're looking for the legendary Kevin Bacon. We're looking for the legendary Kevin Bacon. You just said that, Drax. Your voice is small and mousy. I think maybe he didn't hear you. Ah! You're coming with us. That's a Christmas present. I'm Groot. What was this trailer? <laughs> I mean, Kevin Bacon. Who would have expected him to see? Who would have expected to see Kevin Bacon? Ask Kevin Bacon in a Marvel project. Like, come on. But yeah, Debbie, what are your thoughts on this trailer? Look, I don't know who they got to direct this project or whatever, but eh, I'm gonna say whoever they got it probably stay away from superhero projects for a long time. Probably some random no name or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> But in all seriousness, I think this looks fun. This basically looks like the exact opposite of Werewolf by Night. Yeah. The Marvel format, special project format is great. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. It's a great avenue to be able to see different characters in different situations, you know? The reality is Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is going to be a very big movie. You know, it's going to be the conclusion of the Guardians saga as of right now, potentially setting the stage for what space stuff will be in the future. We're getting characters like Adam Warlock, 
um, the High Evolutionary, where Cosmo is going to be a part of the team. We're, they're introducing Cosmo in this because she's going to be a part of the team in uh, Guardians 3. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of stuff like that. Guardians 3 is going to be their problem. And also, from what we've seen, it's going to be kind of a sad one. This is definitely going to be emotionally somber because we're potentially saying bye, goodbye permanently to multiple Guardians. This one looks like just a fun Christmas adventure. I think this is exactly what it needs to be. One thing I did notice a lot of people pointing out is it looks like Groot might actually be practical, and they might be taking some of those elements that they did with Moon Knight and doing part practical, part CGI for Groot, which, again, I'm all for. You know, expansion of that. Uh, I'm also excited to see the debut of Cosmo as a character fully. You know, we got a cameo before, but killing. Um, I forgot the last name. Uh, I, f- I forgot who's playing. Who's playing her? Oh, she was in Borat. Because uh, uh, Cobb was a girl in this one. Yeah, she was, she was in Borat. Yeah, the Borat one. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. oh, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so she was funny. And also, she was in, um, she, I saw her in Borat. But actually, there was this movie, Bodies, 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 that came out, which I saw mm-hmm. her in. She was actually, I liked her a lot better than that. Because, again, she got to show more of her range than just being psychic to Borat, which was cool. But we could see more of her range. So the idea that we're going to see her potential, you know. It, I doubt Gamora will appear in this one, just from the way they set it up. But, you know, my get is always held on a cameo. Uh, you know, I think ultimately, you know, let's see it. The only thing I'm asking for, the only thing I'm asking for, is since they're walking through LA, I really want them to see a billboard with Chris Pratt on it. I really <laughs> want to see that happen. Mario. <laughs> the Mario movie comes out. <laughs> He's <crazy>. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, let's move on to our final topic, I guess, and that is our um, Ezra Bridger from uh, Star Wars might be getting a spinoff show after Ahsoka. Um, so, Jemmy, again, what are your thoughts on this? Um, my thoughts are basically honestly the same as two years ago, only because there's actually a rumor a while ago that everyone doubted. So a while ago, back when they first greenlit Book of Boba Fett, there's a rumor going around, basically, that they were going to treat the Mandalorian universe, or corner of the Star Wars universe, basically as one show. Every character would get separate spinoffs. So you'd have Book of... The rumors were you'd have Thrawn, the Mandalorian himself, Ahsoka, Ezra, and Boba Fett. All different ones getting their own shows, and they'd all take place roughly at the same time, and then they'd have a big crossover. Oh, yeah, and the... Uh, what's it called? The... Rangers of the New Republic, which got canceled because somebody decided to be a Nazi. Anyway, so, you know, looking at this, I think, again, I'm all for it. You know, Ezra, I think, has the potential to be one of the better characters in Star Wars, especially moving forward. He already has a lot of good groundwork that was laid in the Rebel show, seeing his journey, seeing him going from, you know, this cocky kid to being basically the same. He's honestly, the thing about Ezra that a lot of fans who miss on Rebels miss is he's basically a more fleshed out Luke Skywalker. He's what happens if you actually got to spend more than three movies with Luke and then and see him on screen. He starts mm-hmm. from, you know, this cocky kid who kind of thinks he knows too much, wants to be a part of the galaxy, wants to be a hero, ends up suffering loss, even losing his mentor, just like uh, Luke did, and becoming a better Jedi Knight for it. Now we're going to see basically the same thing that we're asking for with Luke. We're going to see him as a fully, potentially see him as a fully developed Jedi Knight within the galaxy. Whether or not he's still with Thrawn off in the Unknown Regions, or this takes place after that, you know, back when he's united with the rest of the Ghost crew. I think that this has a lot of potential. The one thing I will say, again, is... While I am always excited for new Star Wars, I really want new, new Star Wars. And again, there's some stuff we've heard this year, week that might seem we might get new, new Star Wars. But I want to see other characters, not just characters we've already seen in situations we've already seen and areas we've already seen. The Star Wars time period takes place over quite literally thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Old Republic. Shoot, they could even do some stuff post-Rise of Skywalker and get more into New Republic content. That's more of what I want to see from Star Wars. Does this excite me? Yes. But I hope that in addition to this, we're going to find out about some other projects that also help actually push the saga forward instead of just deepening the saga, which they've already done a pretty good job at since the Disney era started. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, And yeah, I would love to, because I I watched some of Star Wars Rebels. I love the characters in it. And at one point, I'd love to see a trilogy centered around these characters. And hopefully, they are building towards that. I'm not sure if they're there, but hopefully, they are. Because I think Ezra Bajor, again, his potential as a character is great. And I think if done right, he could potentially even surpass Luke Skywalker. Uh, But yeah, 
Uh, I think that wraps up all the news for this week. Uh, Jemmy, do you want to start off with the Patreon questions? Uh, all right. So our first media question comes from Giordo on Reddit, and it's what character would we like to see get a Marvel Studios special presentation? Mon, what do you think? Ooh. I would love to see Mephisto get a Marvel Studios presentation for next year's Halloween. Um, you know, we, now we know Sasha Baron Cohen is playing Mephisto and mm -hmm. Ironheart's coming next year as well. So maybe, you know, give the devil himself a Halloween presentation. That's my pick. <laughs> All right, give the devil his due. I like that. Also, I find it funny <laughs> that we went through quite literally a solid month and a half of Mephisto and now that they actually have the vessel, quite literally, no one cares. <laughs> That's just funny to me on no end. But um, yes, Mephisto would be good. I'm going to say this. Vision. I don't think Vision necessarily needs a full TV show. Don't think he needs a movie. But they left his character in a very interesting spot. And I'd be very interesting to see how they would do it. You know, there was already rumors that Marvel's looking at possibly more heavily adapting the Tom King run. Later down the line, we already know basically the writing's on the wall that there will be a Scarlet Witch project in some form or function, but mm -hmm. uh, again, fully solo, just her. Uh, you know, probably setting up the Children's Crusade for the Young Avengers. Um, I think that seeing a white, white Vision project, that could be really cool. Another character I honestly think probably would be prudent or at least deserve is Sharon Carter, Agent 13. Mm -hmm. As of right now, we know she's the power broker. We know mm -hmm. she's evil. We have no clue why. <laughs> and as a, I'm assuming she's, it'd be kind of weird if she didn't show up in Captain America, uh, a New World Order. But it would be a great chance for Marvel to delve into because, let's be real, the Captain America franchise has treated Sharon like dirt <laughs> to the point where <laughs> she even recognizes on a metatextual level that they treated her like dirt. So... I doubt we're going to get a full backstory for her in New World Order, but this could be a really good chance to develop her on her own before she comes into play for the rest of the stuff. That's a good shout. Another one I would like to see, not now, but later down the line, is you know um, one special presentation project for all the X-Men characters, which are going to be in the main lineup. You know, A Cyclops pres special presentation, a Storm special presentation. maybe even a So we're going to get five million <laughs> special yeah. presentations? Well, just like the core team before the first movie comes out, just so we know who the characters are. You know, like Storm, we could have her origins in Africa and how she was treated right. as a god. Uh, and then you know Colossus's background in Russia, how he was how he was abused over there because of his mutant abilities. And yeah, I would love to see you know just like a 30, 30 minute presentation just highlighting their character. Uh, and yeah, that's 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 about it. I definitely like that. That'd be good. That'd be good. I'd like that. All right, next one. We're hitting this at from Adept underscore Pressure on Reddit. Since it's Halloween season, what are our favorite? Horror movies. Ooh. Ooh. Now, I'll go for this one. Here's the thing. I like horror fiction. I don't say like horror movies. I'm a very visual guy. So even though I can like read and listen to, and even sometimes like on a comic book, like I can read horror comics for some reason, just like actual gore, like, yeah, it gets me. It's not even that I'm scared of it, but like visually, like I see some of the eyes get gouged out and I'll be like, ah. <laughs> um, that being said, favorite horror movies. Oof. Ooh. That's a tough one. Mm. All right, I'm going to say Alien. Alien, interesting. That's an interesting pick. I'm very big fan of claustrophobic horror. Alien and Aliens also. Both of those movies, I think, are some of the peak claustrophobic. And again, just making you feel that like there's literally nothing. Because again, by the numbers books... You know, most horror films at the end of the day, they're pretty predictable. It's about creating that sense of environment, that fear, that dread in the audience. I think alien movies have always, anytime, I can literally watch it, the first alien movie. Any yeah, uh, aliens definitely. Watching uh, Ripley go this stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, alien is definitely a solid pick. Uh, my pick would actually be Get Out. I think that horror movie was absolutely fantastic. You know, Jordan Peele, again, it's a psychological horror, I would say, is top tier. So Get Out, I would say, is my favorite horror movie. What do we have next? Okay, I'm actually going to say that at first, but I wasn't sure if it counts. I've had people tell me that doesn't count as a horror movie. So it I does. So, okay. Come on. If we're doing it, does. <laughs> I, I, could, I could see the argument because at the end of the day, it is much more of a suspense movie and a, I would argue, thriller. I would argue it's 
a a suspense thriller, not a horror movie. But I, I see what they. But I'd still classify it as horror. You know, so we're on the same page. You got me, bro. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll I'll give I'll give a real horror movie. Uh, so my um another one I would pick is Sinister. I'm not sure if you've watched it, but it's about a man uh, and his family. I think I've seen that one. To, yeah. Um, so for our audience who haven't watched it, it's basically about a man and his family. They move into this old uh, sort of haunted house, and he finds tapes of people who previously lived in those houses. And each in each of those tapes, something happens, and uh, at the end, something ends up happening to his family. So yeah, uh, definitely a creepy watch. Uh, but Jemmy, what's our next question? Thoughts on Green Lantern as a character? If done right, I think it can be a catapult for DCU's cosmic side. The potential instances you have for these characters. Of all different types of lanterns, the Manhunters, Martians, Tamrans, etc. And this is from Mahan, Mahan? On Mahan? On Reddit. Um, the Green Lantern comics, the very first comic books I ever read, mm-hmm. were the original Spider-Man run, the main Spider-Man, Planet Hulk, and World War Hulk, which were coming out at that time, and the War of Light saga. Those were my very first introduction to comics. So Green Lantern holds a very special place. It bugs me to no end that they have not figured out how to make a green a good Green Lantern project because Green Lantern, except for the show, the show is really good. I'd highly recommend to anybody that has not watched Green Lantern the animated series, pick it up. Not as good as some of the other famous the animated series of DC, but it's very mm-hmm. solid. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the exception of that, they haven't really been able to get Green Lantern off their feet. Um, they are filming a Green Lantern show right now, a Green Lantern Core show. Who knows if that is live? We'll actually let that see the light of day, but they're seeing it. Um, I think that hopefully Gunn also really likes them because they're they're characters that deserve I think development and the fact that you can do so much with them. This the the analysis in this actually right. They are the gateway to basically the whole cosmic side. In the same way, you could have Guardians be the gateway. You can have them be the gateway because even though they deal with stuff like the cores, you have all the other different cores. You have, you know, their conflicts with the Manhunters. They cross over into alternate universe stuff with, like, the Cordians and Antimatter stuff. So if they eventually want to build up to, like, a Christ on Infinite Earths type stuff, there's all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff you can do. The Blackest Night, which is arguably one of it DC's has, best crossover awards. There. There's all types of yeah. stuff you got. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of potential for the Green Lantern I'd love series. to see that. If, yeah. If, you know, if they... Uh, I really hope... You know, the TV show that's coming and that movie that's been in production for like the last 10 years, when they do eventually come out, I would love for them to set up, uh, you know, the entire cosmic side of the DCU because I think Green Lantern is perfect as the catapult for that. Uh, but yeah, guys, I think that's the end of our viewer questions. Uh, and with that, we wrap up today's episode. So, Jemmy, where can we find you? Well, you can find me at Jemmy underscore 421 on Instagram. And you can find me at Ahmad underscore M05 on Twitter. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for daily content. Leave a five-star review to help the show grow. And we'll see you all again next week. Peace.